All right, it's Monday, it's week three. I like this current stretch of the next week or two of the course because for me, it's hard to give lectures that aren't just about one topic. And a lot of the last few lectures, we've been bouncing around a lot of quick topics. So each lecture has had sort of three or four different things to focus on. Um, that changes a little bit for the next few lectures. We sort of have individual topics for most of them. I like that better as a teacher. Um, you know, it's still challenging and tricky and all that stuff. In terms of uh, current events, if you're just getting started on our homework too, there's a session tomorrow night called our YAH Hours, the Early Assignment Help Hours, run by our section leader, Kate. It's tomorrow night at 7 p.m. in STLC building. So check that out. Homework 2 is due on next Monday, a week from today, right? Isn't that right? <laughs> I forget my own due dates sometimes. Okay, so today we are going to talk about a topic called parameters. And uh, this is a tricky topic to really understand in detail. We're going to be using this concept throughout the, uh, the rest of the course. But it's very powerful and uh, you know, it's a very fundamental concept. So the reading for today's lecture comes from chapter 5 of the textbook. Okay. So let me open up my slides for today. Let me start with a non-programming analogy for a second. So imagine you like to cook and you have a recipe. So here's how to build, here, build, <laughs> I build you a cake. Um, here's how to build you 20 cookies. You, uh, <laughs> you mix four cups of flour, whatever. I totally made up these ingredients. It's probably ridiculously wrong uh, uh, mixture of how much of each of those ingredients you're using. Don't follow this recipe, <laughs> but um, whatever. There's a recipe for making 20 cookies, okay? And then, oh, what if you want to double the recipe? What if you make 40 cookies? Well, you double this and you double that, and you still bake them for 10 minutes, but you double a lot of the ingredients and so on, right? So if you were to imagine that this was code, you might have some code for cooking 20 cookies. And you might have some code for cooking 40 cookies. And what you would find is that those two pieces of code would be very similar to each other, right? Except the little numbers would be different. Um, so of course, we don't like redundancy as computer programmers. So we would maybe try to remove the redundancy by making a method here. Make a method for baking cookies. But the problem is that the code is not exactly the same. The code is similar, but these numbers are changed from one amount of cookies to the other. So a method is tricky because you know a method has kind of this one group of statements that you want to execute in multiple places in your program. This is a group of very similar but not exactly the same statements, right? So what you really wish you could do would be to have something more general where you could say, well, here's how to bake it. N cookies. You use N times this many cups of flour and N times that many uh, eggs and so on. So you can kind of generalize the recipe based on how many uh, cookies you want. And again, this shows a woeful misunderstanding of cooking because you don't just double the ingredients to double a recipe. Any good cook knows it's a little bit trickier than that, but whatever. Forgive me for the moment. Um, this idea of generalizing an algorithm and sort of separating out the part that needs to change if you want to change something about the algorithm. That's called parameterizing the algorithm. And then in this case, the parameter is n, the number of cookies we're baking. Okay? So, you know, we're trying to relate this back to Java, back to programming. So let's look at a specific example. Suppose I want to draw boxes. I want to draw a little square or rectangle of stars with spaces in the middle. So I want to print these boxes on the screen. And, you know, I could literally just print, 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 but I'd like to draw these using loops. Okay? So this is a, uh, this first box is, I believe, a 10 by 4 box, 10 wide and 4 tall. So let's draw that box using loops right now. So let's go to the Eclipse, and I've got a program here called Boxes, and I want to draw a 10 by 4 box. So, help me out. I want to draw it all using loops. So how do I draw the top of the box? I know, you guys feel just like I do. That girls finale yesterday was really just a lot to absorb. And so it's hard to get back to Java just one short day later. I know, I know. But let's try. Come on, pull it together. Do it for Hannah and her baby. Draw it. 
Draw the top of the box. Somebody tell me what to do. Yes? Okay, a for loop that goes how many times? Okay, and what do you want to do inside of this for loop? Draw a star. So, star. If I do that 10 times, I'll have a row of 10 stars. That looks great. Okay, thanks. Um, that's the top of the box. Now, why don't we draw the sort of middle parts of the box? The middle parts are the lines that sort of go vertically. There's no way to do a for loop that goes vertically in the console. You just have to go top to bottom, left to right. So basically, let's draw all of those lines that have the empty gaps in the middle. How many of those lines do I have? Well, I have two of them because it's a height four box. So a lot of times if you're doing lines and then stuff within each line, you have two loops. You have one loop for each line, vertical, and you have another loop for repetitions of characters, horizontal. So what if I do, so that this part here is the top, and then uh, technically you should say print lin to end the line, you know, to go to the next line, because star, 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 go down a line. Um, now let's do the middle of the box. Middle of the box is, you know, two lines with spaces in between, stars with spaces. So I'll do the hard part. If we have two of these lines, then I'll do a for loop that goes up to two instead of ten there. And what goes in there? Again, I'm drawing this part. Help me out. What goes in there? A star, eight spaces, and then another star. Okay, print star uh, for loop j that goes to eight, and that prints a space, and then print another star, and then end the line also. You could just say print lin star, so that'll go down after the, the final star. Okay, good, that's the middle. And then there's the bottom of the box, Bottom of the box looks exactly like the top of the box. It's got a line full of stars. We already did the code for that. So that's this, right? So just copy and paste. In general, I might have said this to you before, in general, if you copy and paste a chunk of code, it might be a sign that you're putting redundancy into your program. In fact, it's literally true that you're pasting the same code twice, so that's probably redundant, but that's okay. Let's come back to that. So we have a 10 by four box, right? I think, I didn't run it yet, but uh, I'm remarkably overconfident in myself. So uh, I think it'll work. Uh, yes, I have a 10 by 4 box. Great, we did a great job. So now, if we want to draw a, how big is the other one on the slide? A uh, 7 by 6 box, I think that's what that is. So now we want to draw a 7 by 6 box. Okay, let's do it. Hmm. It probably looks a little bit like this code, right? So let me copy all of this code. So let's say draw a 7 by 6 box. We paste all of this code here. Uh, I'm going to put one more line break just so there's a blank line between the two boxes. But okay, so tell me the parts that I need to change to make it into a seven by six box. Tell me all the changes I need to make. Yeah. Change the tens into sevens. Okay, fine. Are there any other things I need to change? Yes, sir? Change the 8 to a 4. Change the 8 into a 4. Uh, OK, let's try it. What about this 2? Does that stay 2? So this is 7 wide by 6 tall. Oh, you want this one to be a 5? Because it's 2 less than 7? What about this i goes to 2? What should that be here? 4? because it's like all the lines except the top one and the bottom one. So where am I getting these numbers? I mean, if either you see it or not, but like four means there's four of these lines in this middle part here, right? Four lines in the middle part and five spaces here in this center going left to right, right? So four lines with five spaces. Okay, let's try it. Hey, cool, we have a seven by six box. This is great. So, <laughs> the code, I'm baking 10 cookies, I'm baking 20 cookies, I'm doing this very similar piece of code twice, 
It's not exactly the same piece of code, but it's very similar, right? Well, what you probably are noticing is that these numbers are pretty strongly related to the width and the height of the box, right? Okay, well, why don't we think about that for a second? What if I go up here and I'm drawing the 10 by 4 box and I go, hmm. Okay, what if I said int width equals 10, int height equals 4, draw a box of that size using those variables to guide you. So tell me some changes I should make to this code, the 10 by 4 box code, so that it'll use these variables. And I guess the goal would be then if I later change the variables, the 10 by 4 box would totally change to be the new size of the variables values. Okay? So how do I do that? Help me out. What do, what do I change? Yeah. Can you use private static final? Oh, I could use private static final for a constant value. That's true. There's a specific reason I don't want to do that here because what I'd like to do is run the code with 10 and 4 and then down here I'd like to say width equals 7, height equals 6, and then I'd like to rerun the same code and hopefully that same kind of piece of code will run a 7 by 6 box. And if I make a private static final constant, I'm not allowed to change a value to a second value like that. But if I weren't going to do two boxes, private static final would be fine. So help me out. What do I change so this code will use these variables? Yes? Sure, where it says 10, put width instead. Whatever the width of the box is, put that many stars on the top and the bottom lines. Okay, there. Great. Tell me some other stuff I need to change. Yeah? Uh, wherever it says 2, it will say height minus 2. Yeah, the reason that there are two lines of spaces is because it's four tall, but the top one and the bottom one are, are, are drawn already. And so the middle is, like if it were 100 tall, it would be 1 and then 98 and then 1. So it's the height minus 2. That's how many lines there are in this middle section of the box. Do you understand? So this should be height minus 2. Okay, great. Anything else we need to change? Uh, yeah, go ahead. The 8 is width minus 2, right? The reason it's width minus 2 is because if you look at this, these lines, 1, 2 of the characters are stars and the rest of them are spaces. So whatever the width is, 2 characters less than that is how many spaces you need. Great. So that's a sort of generalized version of this algorithm, right? I think. We haven't tried it yet, but I think. Now, if you take this exact code with no modifications and you go down here to the 7 by 6 box, and I'm just going to grab the 7 by 6 version and I'm going to totally paste over it with that general version that we changed it to up above. Okay? So what I'm hoping for here is that the exact same piece of code now draws boxes of two different sizes. Okay? And I'll prove to you that it works because if I make the width be 17 and the height be 9, I should get a 17 by 9 box. That's pretty cool, right? So this is great. It just seems like being able to draw boxes is a super useful thing that every programmer would need. So, you know, I feel like maybe I should make a method for drawing boxes. Let's do that. This piece of code here, you know, it's always good to decompose our program and make methods and things. So let's make a method called public void draw a box, paste. And the thing is mad at me. It says width not known and height is not known. It underlines those in red, right? That's not good. So up here, if I'm going to draw the box at size 10 by 4, maybe instead of all this code, I'll say draw box. Println, width, height, set it to that, draw box again. You understand? That's kind of what my program wants to do. Draw a 10 by 4 box, draw a 7 by 6 box, or 17 by 9 box, or whatever it might be, right? You understand like, what I'm trying to do here? That, that seems like a better version of the program. If you look at main, it's shorter, it reads better. but this version doesn't compile. Why is the program not able to see the width and the height down there? Hmm? The variable is declared outside of the method. Yeah, we had a fancy word for that last week. I called it scope. The scope of the variable is the method that you declare it in and not any other methods. So width and height exist in the run method. They don't exist in the draw box method. Darn. Well, that would have been cool if we could do that, right? I guess we have to give up. But, but wait, <laughs> plot twist. Uh, there is a way to do something like what I've got here, and that's using this feature called parameters. So let me show you how to do it. 
A parameter is when you send a value into a method as you are calling the method. So it's like if you're baking n cookies, it's like sending in what you want the value of n to be, right, as you're about to bake. So you can write a method called box or draw box that will draw a box of any size. And as you are calling that method, you can specify what size you want. You can say, I want a 10 by 4 box. I want a 7 by 6 box. If you're going to use this feature, this parameter feature, there are two things that you need to do. One is when you're writing the code for the method, like if you're actually writing the code for the draw box method, you have to say this method needs the following parameters to be given to it in order to run. You have to specify what parameters are needed. That's the first thing you need to do. The second thing you need to do is every time that you execute the method, every time run calls into that method, you have to tell it what values to use for those parameters. So those two things have to match up. I need these parameters. Here they are. Those are the two things. So draw a 10 by 4 box, draw a 7 by 5 box. <laughs> My slide doesn't look right. I don't know why. Never mind. Here's the way that you declare this parameter. Inside the parentheses, when you're writing the method, you declare a variable. You declare a variable. It's technically called a parameter variable. This example on the slide declares a single parameter of type int. So it's kind of a dumb method. I'm just showing you a short example so I can fit something on the slide. What the code here is saying is I've written a method named password, and it asks for a parameter named code. And when you run the method, it'll print the password is, and then it'll print the code that you supply. So that's the first step. Tell it what parameters your method needs. The second step is when you execute the method, when you run the method, you have to supply the value for that parameter. So if you say password 42, it means you're running the password with int code set to 42. But if you say password 12345, it means you're running the password method with the int code parameter set to 12345. And then it causes these two outputs. The password is this, the password is that. Um, it doesn't compile if these two pieces of the program don't match up with each other. If you ask for a parameter and the caller doesn't supply one, it doesn't compile, and so on. If you want, uh, uh, let me come back to this slide. Hold on a second. If you want to pass more than one parameter, you can specify them comma separated. And then when you execute the method, you can supply all the values you want to store comma separated. So if you go back to this box program, let me just demonstrate kind of this idea. I think an example is helpful. If I go back here, if you look at this draw box method, basically what I want to do is I want to say, I'll draw a box of any size you want but you have to tell me what size you want. So the way that you say that is right here in the parentheses of the method, you write int width, comma, int height. If you tell me what width you want and you tell me what height you want, I'll draw a box of that size. Do you notice all the red underlines went away? The ones down on the bottom didn't, uh, the, those ones went away. So now, <clears throat> this method is fine, the part that's broken is the part that executes the method. We have to now write the values that we want for the width and the height inside the parentheses up there in the run method. So instead of saying int width equals 10, int height equals 4, you just write 10 comma 4 here. And instead of saying 17 and 9 here, you say Dropbox 17 comma 9. So it just in terms of how do I read this, what the heck is going on, Basically, this is still saying, I want to jump down here and run this method. But when you write 10 here, Java goes and stores the 10 into that. When you write 4 here, Java goes and stores the 4 into that. And then it runs all this code with those values for those variables. And then when the method is done, it goes back to run and continues. And then it gets to here. And this call, it sets that variable to 17. And it sets that variable to 9. And it reruns the same code. So it does the different things, different calls, depending what values you supply for the parameters. And the order is implicit. Like whatever you write here first becomes the value of the first parameter. Whatever you write here second becomes the value of the second parameter. So it's a pretty powerful uh, language feature, really, once you get the hang of it. Like if I run this program again, I do get the two boxes. But again, like now this method is generalized so I can draw things of any size. I can say I want a box of size 15 by 3. And over here, I want a box of 8 by 5 or whatever. 
and I should get boxes that are those sizes. I can run this method as many times as I want with any parameters I want, and it'll do the right thing. Uh, question, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, instead of a, a number, that's a great question, yeah. What he said was, instead of writing a number here, could I put a variable here? Yeah, um, so, so like what you would do is, if you said like int a equals 15, uh, you know, int b equals 4, int c equals, uh, you know, b minus 1, so that's 3, right? I could write a comma c, and that's the same as passing 15 and 3, and so the value of A would go to here and the value of C would go to here. So it would draw a 15 by 3 box. Or heck, I could write an expression here. I could write A times 2 plus 1 and C minus 4 over B and it would do the calculation and figure out what value that is and whatever that results to, it'll pass here. And it'll do the calculation of whatever value that is and it'll pass that value there. Um, so yeah, certainly you can, you can do those kind of things and sometimes you absolutely want to do that. A little bit more confusing to, to read uh, if you're just learning what parameters are, but you absolutely are allowed to do something like that. Uh, another question, yeah. Could you also define a width and height variable up in your run method? Could you define an int width up here? Yeah. Width equals two, int height equals nine. Sure, in fact, uh, it, it, it yellow underlined them because I haven't used them. It underlines if you don't use a variable. Um, yeah, you can write an int width and height up here, but they have nothing to do with the ones down here. One of the things we talked about briefly last week when we learned about scope is you can have two variables that have the same name as long as they exist in different parts of the program. I think, in general, this is confusing for students sometimes. Like, well, wait, there's a width up there and there's a width down there. Which width is width? Which, I don't know. So I don't, I don't always like to do that because I, I want to keep things kind of separate. But uh, yeah, it kind of reminds me of uh, my, my grandpa and, and my uncle and my great grandpa all had the same name, like Robert Earl Stepp, the first, the second, the third, and they could never keep their mail straight. You know, they're different people and different names, but they, their lifespans over, overlapped and so it was confusing. So I think, uh, you know, I'm not gonna name any of my kids Martin, so <laughs> just keep it real simple, you know? Something like that going on here. Um, other questions, I thought I saw some other people's hands up. Yeah, great question. Um, I'll repeat your question. Like, you're asking about how do I know when I want to use this to simplify my code or break apart my code as opposed to asking the user. Uh, I do think parameters where they get most interesting and also kind of most tricky is when you start trying to think about how they collide with all the other features we've been learning about up to this point. And one of the features we've been learning about was asking the user for input with read int and this kind of thing, you know, where you, you ask the user to type a value for you. Um, this feature is a little bit different than that, but you can use them both together or you can use one or the other. It kind of depends on the specific needs of the program. Now, let's compare them. Asking the user to type in a value is a little bit like parameterizing your code, except it's parameterized as the program runs when the user types in that number. This version is parameterized as the code is being written and the values that are, that are written here are always going to be the same ones. If I wanted to kind of mix the benefits of both of those approaches, I could do something like this. I could draw two boxes of known sizes. Then I could say int w equals read int uh, box width, int h equals read int box height, question mark. And then I could say I want to draw a box that's that size. So now I'll say draw a box w h. So whatever they typed, I will pass those values to here as the width and the height, and it will do that, I hope. So let's show that. The first two boxes are just the known sizes, the fixed sizes. But now I say I want a box that's 20 by 7, and that's what I get. So you can use these two things together if you want to. I have seen students, you know, I think parameters are deceptively quite hard to understand at first in, in terms of like all the different subtleties of them and stuff. But I have seen students who, you know, have trouble differentiating the difference of read int versus parameter. And again, it's all about whether I, the programmer, want to supply a value or the user wants to supply a value when the program is running. Those are two different things. 
of course, it's confusing when I'm using my own program because I'm the programmer and I'm the user, so oh, no, it's uh, tricky, but not always will those two people be the same person. Um, how are we doing so far? Any other questions just on what I've shown you so far? Let me tell you a few details like about how it really works because I think it's important to actually understand. You know, I've always talked about kind of walking through a program line by line when it runs. I want to make sure you guys understand how to do that when you see parameters. So actually I want to back up for a second. Um, the way that a parameter is passed, the way, that, the way that a method with parameters runs is when Java gets to this line, it says, oh, you want to do a chant of three times. So it says chant int times, do a for loop that many times that prints Java is great. So, okay, when you say chant three, Java jumps down here to the chant method. It takes that three and it stores it into like, there's a little piece of memory, you know, a variable's a little piece of memory. So it stores that number into that piece of memory. Then it executes this code with that stored in there. So it loops three times, you know. When the method's done, it goes back to run and it goes on to the next one. So now we have seven. So now the seven goes over here and it's stored in that piece of memory and it runs the code again. So these values get passed along. And it kind of relates to the earlier question the gentleman had about like, can I pass a name of another variable or an expression or something like that? The value of that expression gets put into that piece of memory and then the program runs, okay? So we wrote the box drawing program. I wanna talk about, you can have more than one method in your program that uses parameters. So if you look at our code, look at the draw box method. There's a little bit of redundancy in this code, right? What's the piece that's redundant? If you, if you have a good memory, I even copied it and pasted it, so you know it's redundant. The top and the bottom are the same code, right? Okay, what do these pieces of code do? They draw a line of stars. So, gosh, I don't want to have that code twice, so let's do a cut on that, and let's go down here, and let's say public void line of stars, and let's paste that. Great, so now up here, at the top is, uh, let's do line of stars, cool, and down here and for the bottom, I don't need to repeat that piece of code. There, line of stars, top, bottom, great. Oops, now line of stars doesn't compile. <laughs> What's the problem here? What's wrong with it? What do I need to do? Yeah, the line of stars needs to know the, how many stars, like the width of the line. So basically it needs this. And so again, like I think what, what's confusing to some students is they're like, well, the width is right here. And then I call line of stars, so can't he kind of like see the width because the guy who called him has the width? No, it's like the, the scope of things is bound to the method that they're in, no other methods. If I want to share this width with him, then what I do is I'll say, I need you to tell me what the width should be. And what I want his width to be is my width, the same as me. I want his line to be as wide as my box is wide. So I will give him my width as his value to run himself. So now here, there. Uh, you know, one thing, like just, I wanna be clear, I was talking about how using the same name too much can be confusing, right? So just, let me just clarify, like if this one down here is called length, the length of the line of stars, and then I change this to say length, like you still say width here. I want the length of this line to be equal to the width of the box, you know what I mean? So the naming matters, you might say, well if, if I call it length here, then why don't I write length here? No, no, no. The reason that that doesn't work is because I'm supposed to specify what length of a line I want. What length do I want? This many. So I write width here. I don't know. Maybe I'm confusing you more. But I'm just trying to point out that like, when you execute the method, you have to supply how many things you want. And that's described in terms of the variables that I have here in this method, in terms of the variables I have in the Dropbox. I keep saying drop box instead of draw box because that's where my wife works. I've got my drop box running up here on my computer while we write the draw box function, whatever. Um, okay, so you can have multiple methods that, uh, that take parameters. So like if you want to trace through this, like up here when I say, let me see, can I get this all on the screen? There, I have to shrink the font a little bit. If I say 15 here, then that becomes this width and if I say line of stars width, 
that means 15. So that same 15 goes down here and becomes length for that context, that little piece of code. So anyway, that value has the name width for one portion of my program, and it has the name length for another portion of my program. Cool. What else? I think that's, I think that's all I wanted to do with this code. Um, okay, what about this middle part of the program? Well, it's certainly not as redundant as these lines of stars on the top. You will notice that um, I'm doing this thing several times in my code where I have a for loop and then inside the for loop I print some character. So it's kind of a repeated number of copies of a character. So um, there is a way to turn that into a method, but I don't know, I'm not sure if, uh, if I want to show it because like, it's kind of like black magic type of stuff, but you think you guys might be ready for it? I don't know, I think I could show you. If you don't get it, it's cool. Um, what if instead of just a line of stars, I want to be able to draw a line of any character? So I just say line. And so somehow you have to say what you want to draw a line of, followed by how many of them you want. See these guys in quotation marks where you specify characters and text and things like that? Those are called strings. We're going to learn about them in more detail on Friday. But you can turn a string into a parameter also. You can actually go here and you can write string s int length. And then here, you're saying whatever string you give me, I'll print repeated copies of it. And then here, when you call the method, the string I want to print is the star string. So strings are a little weird because they have a capital S for their name. They have quotes around them. We haven't talked about them very much. Again, this is kind of the black magic version of this program. But having that method able to print any character repeatedly, we could now remove a little bit more redundancy, right? Where else can I use, oh, it's not called line of start, it's just called line. Where else can I use the line method? Yes? The spaces, right. I want to draw a space that many times, right? So instead of that for loop, I'll say line of spaces, comma, width minus two is how many of them I want. So I'll just delete that loop. There. Doesn't that look better? Doesn't that Dropbox code look kind of cool now? Draw a line of stars that wide. Then have height minus two lines of a star followed by that many spaces followed by a star. And then the bottom is a line of stars that wide. That looks a lot more like how you would describe that in English, doesn't it? I always think it's a good sign if your program reads like almost like English. It means you probably wrote it well. Um, don't want to pull a muscle praising myself here. Uh, oh, <laughs> here's an interesting thing though. It doesn't look quite right. Oops. Do you know why it looks wrong? It's subtle. I'm drawing big letter C's now or something. What happened? It's kind of so. I guess the part for the part that's actually broken is down at the bottom of the program. Any idea what's wrong? Yeah. Is the second star printed on a second line? The second star is printed on a second line. If you look carefully at the code for this line method, it actually ends the line. So like we tell it to print these spaces, and then oops, it goes down to the next line, and then the closing star gets printed down there. So it's just, it's a subtle bug. A lot of you guys, I bet if you go to write your rocket ship thing for assignment two, you probably run into something like that if you're not careful, where, oops, I guess maybe the line of that length, maybe I don't want a line break after that now. If I want this to be more generalizable, maybe the top and the bottom need a line break afterward, but this one here doesn't. And so maybe that'll make the boxes look right there. So uh, box width 15 by six looks pretty good. Okay, 
So that part with the strings uh, is a little bit more advanced, and I'm going to get back to strings later. I didn't really want to get into that too much today, but I just thought that might make the program a little bit cooler. And I'm just trying to show you how powerful parameters are. It really allows you to write code that's at a totally different level. Like, did you notice that I used to have nested for loops, and I don't even have any nested for loops anymore. I made the program so much cleaner that I didn't need them. So that's the kind of power that we're talking about once you get good at using parameters. Okay. If you really want to figure out if you're good at parameters, you can go look at these fiendish problems that I like to make you solve. Uh, here, it's called uh, Parameter Mystery. <laughs> You'll hate these, <laughs> but uh, uh, they'll build character. It's like Brussels sprouts. Um, so how the heck do you figure out the output of a program like this? And of course, I've used confusing names so that it, there's no intuition about what the program would be doing. <coughs> And if you look at this kind of code, what you'll see is that I reuse the same variable names, just like I said maybe you shouldn't do a few minutes ago. I've gone out of my way to do that here. And just as a, a way of understanding this program, let me point out, oops, sorry. Let me point out that there's an X and a Z and a Y here, and those are not the same as this X, Y, and Z up here. They just happen to have the same names as the one up there. So if you want to interpret how this program runs, See this first call where it says mystery z, y, x? What value gets stored here for that first run of that method? So the way that you should think about it is the order is the key thing that matters. The thing I always do to try to fool you is when I use the same letters and you think that the letters matter. You might say, oh, x. OK, well, x is 9. So this thing down here is 9. Eh, wrong. Here, I'm saying z is the first parameter. That means z's value goes to here. So for this first run of the mystery method, this first parameter receives the value of 5. Do you see that? And then the second parameter, y, comes down to here. So for this uh, value, it receives y's value, which is 2. And then this thing, x, is the third parameter. And he goes over here, and his value is 9. So for this first run of the code, x is 5, and z is 2, and y is 9. And that doesn't match what's written up here. So you have to be careful about this stuff. Then what do I do with them? I print lin z, comma, y minus x. I print z, 2, comma, y minus x, 9 minus 5, 4. I print 2, comma, 4. And uh, so that's kind of how you walk through this, uh, this type of code. And yes, it is written to maximize frustration. <laughs> so I think after you do a couple of these and get the hang of them, it starts to make more sense. What do you think? Question about that? Yes? Oh, wait, are the A, B, C, D, multiple choices? That's like a multiple choice problem, right? Like, is it the first one? Is it the second one? Right. So maybe that maybe this looks confusing. I just meant like, is it one of? Is it this or is it this or is it this? It turns out, I guess, this first line doesn't isn't matched by any of the other ones. So maybe you could already conclude that it's A. But yeah, I wouldn't give you it as multiple choice if it were like on a test or something. Right? Okay. Well, let's look at a little bit bigger program. I think where this gets challenging is if I just give you a problem and I ask you to solve it. And I say, you should use parameters here. But I don't really tell you where or which ones or just, you should kind of decompose the problem. It's almost like when you're doing Carol or when you're doing homework too, you're supposed to decompose the problem into methods. But what methods? That's part of the design of the program. Let's see if we can do that. So let's do this. I've got a program here I want to write called investment. Calculates compound interest. Uh, you know how compound interest works? Is like, you know, you, you start out with a principal amount. And then every so often, maybe monthly or whatever, you, you get some interest. And then as that gets added in, your amount grows larger. And then for the next month, the interest is on the new larger amount. So it's compounding over time. So like 100 bucks, 3% interest for five months, this extra 93 cents comes from that compounding. Now, technically, this is kind of bogus because compound interest usually takes a year. And I'm doing it where it compounds once a month. But whatever, who cares? So, this fancy looking formula here, I mean, this isn't that hard. It's just sort of like however many months or periods you have, you add in that much to the amount and then you keep growing it by that amount each time. 
let's try to write a program called investment that calculates some of this stuff. Don't get too worried about the math. I think let's just kind of get the, the basic shell of the program working first. We need to ask the user for all these numbers and then calculate some things, okay? So I, I think uh, I can help us a little bit get started with this. So I've got this thing here that says investor number one, and I've got another thing here that says investor number two. And of course, what I hope you're seeing is, oh, those two parts look really similar to each other, right? So probably there's some redundancy there that I need to fix. Maybe for now, let's make a program that only works for one investor, and then we can think about the two investor aspect, okay? So let me grab all this, and let me go to my uh, Eclipse. I've got a file here called investment.java, and let's just paste and print lin quote, something like that, right? Paste, uh, let's see, like that, like that, like that, like that, and one more. Okay, now that's not quite right because uh, we need to ask the user for some of these, like this one where he types $100, um, that one is, I'm asking the user to type the, the number, so, how do I ask the user for a, a real number like this? Do you remember? You say read double, remember? So, okay, how about uh, double initial amount equals read double? Okay, and in comments, I'll just write the numbers from the testing on the, on the slide so I can retry those same numbers. And then the interest rate, the user typed that in as well, right? So that's another read double. Double interest equals read double. And then the default for that was 3%. Number of months, that's another, that's probably a, you probably just have a whole month, so maybe that's a read int. Int months equals, uh, months equals read int. Okay. Five. And then this stuff is all calculated, I think. Okay, let's do it. Let's try to calculate the final amount of money. So if you want to look at this formula here, you can. So start with the um, initial value times one plus the interest rate raised to the power of the number of uh, periods. And you say, oh, it's like an exponent. Marty, you didn't teach me how to do an exponent yet. I'm stuck. Well, there is a way to do exponents, and I'm still not going to teach you what it is because I'm a horrible person, but could you do exponentiation using what you know already from this course without using anything else? Yes? You can do a for loop of that type of something. Do a for loop of multiplication, right? Uh, three to the fifth is just multiply by three five times in a loop, right? Something like that. So we don't need some exponentiation. Multiplication is all we need. We don't even need multiplication. We can just add multiple. To Wait, that's too, that's too simple. Let's not do that. But um, right, so just add in the interest rate repeatedly. Let's do it. So um, compute final amount, double final amount. So if you're going to compute something by repeatedly adding the interest into it, we are accumulating the value, the final value of the investment here. We learned about cumulative algorithms, right? Some of the key ideas there are you declare a variable first outside of any loop, and then you modify the value of that variable inside of a loop. That's the general structure of that code. So we declare some final amount. What should the final amount start at? I mean, if you look at this uh, equation, you're sort of going from one place of money to another place of money. What are those two places? Yeah? Yeah? Yes? So go from the present value to the future. So start with the present value. So start with what I, I think I called it the initial value here. Okay, start with the initial amount. Now how do I get it to be the final amount? You said do a loop. Okay, so a for loop that how many times should I repeat? Like I think in this equation here, you want this, right? That many times. What is that in my, in my code? It's a number of months, right? However many months there are, I'm going to repeatedly apply interest that many times. So for loop that goes from zero to months, and months is that variable up above that I've read. And then what am I doing in there? I'm like adding the interest rate to the amount, right? 
So I want to say, hey, final amount, I'm going to add some stuff to you. Should I say plus equals interest? Add the interest in? That's not quite right, is it? And this is always our challenge, right? How do we translate English to Java or translate math or accounting, finance to Java? Yeah? Interest times months. Well, the times months, I think, comes into this through here. The months go into the equation as being this exponent. And so I think that's kind of how the months become part of our computation. But I think you're right that the interest needs to be scaled up times something in order for this to come out right. Yeah? Times the present value. Times the present value, the initial amount. Okay, let's try it. So it's like you earn 3% of your $100. You know, 3% times your $100. Let's see what happens. So final amount equals dollar sign plus final amount. Profit. Let's do the profit and the other thing next. <laughs> boxes. No, I don't want boxes. I want uh, to run this other program. Initial amount, 100 bucks, 3%, five months. It says oh, $115. It should be $115.93. It's a little off. It's not a rounding error. It's just we didn't quite calculate it correctly. Do you know what's wrong with it? Yeah? Oh, it needs to be one plus? Yeah, I think. I think the plus equals is kind of the one plus because I'm the one and he's the rest, you know what I mean? Like, I think the, the real issue here is you need to say times final amount because the interest from last month is now part of my final and I need to use that as part of the next month and I need to use that as part of the next month. So as the final amount is growing, the interest that applies should be applying to all of that grown number, you know what I mean? So anyway, I think that gives me the right uh, calculation, 3%, five months. 92 cents now. We can talk about rounding numbers in a minute, but that's the right number, basically. Okay? So, I have investor number one, and I have investor number two. I want to do this code twice. You could do it as a for loop. I'd rather do it as a method. So, I'd rather have something called like public void investor. And then here you say investor number one, and you say investor number two. How do I make it say different things for different investors? Like up here, if I say investor, and then investor again. Yeah? Have the number one or number two be a parameter? Yeah, have the sort of what investor number it is be a parameter to the method. It's only used in one little place, but how about like I say int number, what number investor are you? Investor number plus this variable plus that. So now I say, notice how this doesn't compile all of a sudden? because it's saying, hey, you didn't tell me what investor number this is. How about this one's investor one and that one's investor two? <laughs> Great, awesome. Okay, so now I've just got a little bit of time left here and one thing I wanted to do with this was I wanted to print how good of an investment it is based on how much profit you make. So if you make, uh, what do I have here? 10% profit or less, it's weak. 10 to 50, it's medium, and over 50, it's strong. These are pretty silly numbers I chose, but whatever. So I want to print how good of an investment it is. So something like uh, public void uh, print uh, quality of the investment. So something like, you know, if the profit is less than 10%, then print Lynn, what did I say, weak, medium, or strong, weak. Otherwise, if the profit is less than 50, it's medium. And otherwise, if it's more than that, I'll print Lynn that it's strong. So I just made up this variable named profit. I don't know what the profit is. How would this method know what the profit is? I could use a parameter for the profit. If you tell me how much profit it made, I'll tell you how good of an investment it was. So here, 
when I've calculated the final amount, I want to print the quality of the investment. But I need to know what profit to pass. How do you know how much profit you made? Yeah? How much you ended with minus how much you started with. Thanks. Double profit equals final amount minus initial amount. That's the profit in dollars. This code down below wants the profit in percent. So this is going to be like, you know, 19.53 or whatever. How do I know the percent profit? We'll calculate this, then we'll get out of here. We're just about out of time. So percent profit, how do you calculate that? Profit divided by the initial amount. If you made five bucks out of a hundred bucks, you made five percent. And just to make it a whole number, you can say a hundred times profit over amount. Print quality percent profit. Let's try it real quick and then we'll go home if it works. So a uh, hundred bucks, three percent interest, five months. We made uh, $15.92, so we have a medium investment. I'm out of time, so I've got to stop there. We'll do more with parameters on Wednesday. See you then. Go to Yeah Hours tomorrow night. Thanks. Hi. I was just going to say I really like that last example because I actually do investing. Um, and I was this morning writing it. My roommate was to say it. So he's helping me write it. So I figured out whether or not something's a good investment based on what oh. Cool. Yeah, well, of course, my uh, yeah. house is a good yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, I just thought it's funny that that's the example you chose. Yeah. I was thinking like, if the trading multiple is like higher than the average, then print like warning PE is greater than. It's hard to say for sure if you have one for me, so you definitely have to see the You know, I have the point of something super simple for a lecture, it's as simple as I can. And my goal is to just make it close enough to the wheel and like pick something that might work. Yeah, so that's what I was doing this morning. I, I did the quadratic uh, problem this morning and I was like, wait, I guess it could be the thing probably later for myself. Sudoku in the morning, <laughs> it's like, I mean, he took it last quarter, and so he's like, it was really fun, you should take it, and I was like, well, you know, I, I, I do, I don't know what I want to do spring quarter, so I said, so sure, so I'm really enjoying it, I really like it. That's great, I'm, I'm glad that's yeah. happening. I think by the end of this class, um, there'll be a lot of little programs like the one you described yeah. that you'd be able to write, and uh, I think this stuff is really useful as a, as a sort of plug-in into yeah. other fields, as like, yeah. something that can like, Oh, I have a ton of medical data. Oh, God, I don't want to sit there and look at all of it. I just want to, like, punch through it. I think that just one or two classes of CS can kind of get you to a point where I can do that. I enjoy seeing the different people. I just want to let you know. Yeah, cool, man. Thanks for letting me know. See you later. Right, John, version of Trevor What? Right, John, version of I just have a quick question. So we're not allowed to use the textbook on the and final, but if, like, say, like, with our partner, we just want to, like, split it half and half. Um, I don't want you to share books in the exam because basically if you're passing papers to other students it's just kind of like like basically okay the honor code of course you're supposed to work alone and everybody sort of knows that they're not supposed to like copy off other students and stuff and of course in the room if you see somebody who's doing something that they're not supposed to do you're supposed to like talk to someone about it and all that right so I think as the teacher I don't want to create a situation where it's impossible for other students to see, to tell 
if students are doing things that are inappropriate or not. And I think if it's okay to like pass resources around to other students, it becomes really hard to know if students are sharing answers. Not, and I know you wouldn't do that. But, but do you understand what I'm saying? It makes it impossible for anyone to know if anyone were sharing. So, so now, of course, I don't want to tell you that you have to go spend all that money on it, right? So the compromise here is I have a couple of copies of it. I bring them to the test and I put them up here. And you can always mouse over the arrow to see what the error is. Yeah, I, I, so I you're, not, you're not allowed I to just like, keep it for the whole test. But then I'm like, ah, maybe that's not allowed. But, but if you need it for a minute or two, you come up and look at some stuff and then you go back and look at some So it's not ideal, but at least you're not doing it. If you and your buddy want to share one, I think you can do it for everything. It's making it really loop through it. You could just pick which one. Maybe one of you guys gets to look for the midterm. So I would think about maybe there's a structure that we learn about where you can loop based on some condition being true or false. Okay. Okay. So there's not really a way to get it to go back to the top, but there might be a way for you to add a loop somehow based yeah. on the loops that we've learned about. So I thought about like putting this one like at the beginning of the loop, but then it would start the game by saying, "Do you want to play again?" Which makes no sense. Right. So maybe there's a. So you're on the right track. Okay. You're on the right track. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. let me think about it. Thank you. Uh huh. All right. I take a look. We're going to see if we can figure out the submission issue. Oh, cool. So, um, so I saw this like a uh, kind of pop up thing. Okay. So I thought, um, it worked out. Uh huh. But I guess uh, my submission is still.